So welcome everybody to the 8th Helen Lester Memorial Lecture. Great to see everybody here. Just going to talk a little bit about Helen. Helen was a colleague and a friend. She was a GP and, and a brilliant academic. Helen shone a light on the inequalities that people with severe and enduring mental health problems had. People with SMI die approximately 15 to 20 years before somebody without a severe mental illness. And that's really due to their physical health problems. And Helen told us that we needed to be bothered about Billy. And if you haven't heard about Billy, do look on the RCGP website for her video. Absolutely inspiring. And because of Helen um, and her far too early death, we're here today for the eighth Helen Lester Memorial Lecture. Thanks. Um, I also had the pleasure of working with uh, Helen, and um, in the words of uh, Reginald Perrin, I wouldn't be here today without her, really, in that respect. Um, and she certainly set the trajectory for working around health inequality. So it was a great pleasure working with Helen when she was at Manchester University. And she um, certainly got my interest in juices going around looking at health inequalities, particularly around learning disabilities. Um, uh, that kind of step and journey has been evolved over time. And uh, we, um, Amy and I worked uh, on a project uh, that she's gone on to do really well on around diabetes going back a few years. Um, but um, and Amy's been really kind and helpful in stepping in at the last moment. Uh, but the, the work is relevant. It's really important. Amy's um, a senior uh, is it senior. Research Fellow through Wellcome at Leeds yes, University. Yes, that's right. Uh, and she also works for WHO uh, Disability Team, and that's a job I'd like to have. So um, <laughs> at some point, I'll be tapping up Amy um, <laughs> just to find out how on earth you do that. But clearly, she's well-connected, and I really want to look forward to finding out how she's engaging with uh, a disadvantaged community and hard to reach to in some ways uh, around learning disability and the work she's done. So thank you, Amy. Thank you. I'm delighted and also humbled to be here to be asked to talk at the Helen Lester Memorial Lecture. When I was asked to give this talk, I went back to Helen's lecture, Being Bothered About Billy, to watch it again. And what struck me were the similarities between the outcomes for people with serious mental illness and for people with a learning disability the reduced life expectancy, the diagnostic overshadowing, the use of um, obesogenic antipsychotics, maybe the overuse and overprescribing of them, and also the lack of change in that situation going on years and decades, despite efforts, reports, and publications saying that things are going to change for these groups. We still see inequalities for both of these groups. So the key message of my talk is that we need to think about our current practice in clinic and in research. Because if we don't think about inequalities in the way we do things, we will continue to entrench them in our practice. Unless we change the way we work with people with learning disabilities and the way we do research, we compound those health inequalities. So why people with a learning disability? Well, a woman with a learning disability is likely to die 18 years earlier than a woman without a learning disability and for similar causes. <clears throat> a man with a learning disability, and these figures are pre-COVID, I might add, um, was likely to die about 13 years earlier. A learning disability is a diagnosis. It's not a death sentence. It doesn't indicate a certain and particular illness. And yet, the stats show that there is something going on here. So then during COVID, we found that people were dying at 3.6 times the rate of the non-learning disabled population during COVID. And if you took the younger age group, the 18 to 34 year old age group, they were dying on average, they were 30 times more likely to die of COVID than somebody without a learning disability in that age group. So there were numerous reasons why this was happening and there was some vulnerabilities 
that were present in a population, some um, particular living arrangements, health conditions, but a lot of it was to do with the structures and the way we responded. So first of all, we had the NICE guidance, which is slightly infamous now, um, NG159, if anybody wants to look it up. And it was guidance on how to triage for COVID. And it was based on a frailty framework. And the frailty framework basically placed a lot of people with a learning disability into the categories of higher levels of frailty to be triaged later. And the Royal College of Physicians had to issue guidance to say, actually, we have never validated this tool with a learning disabled population or a younger population. So it's not really suitable to triage them. But some damage had already been done. Some people were making clinical decisions about COVID based on this guidance and trust had been lost in the system by people with learning disabilities and those that care for them. And then, unfortunately, things didn't improve. We found that there were do not resuscitate notices being put on people's records. And families were objecting to these and struggling to get them removed. And what happened to the people who didn't have families to advocate for them? A lot of them were, I assume, not resuscitated during that time. We're beginning to see the effects of this in the data that we're looking at now. But again, trust was lost. People who thought they could go to hospital if they were ill with COVID were beginning to think it wasn't a safe place for them anymore. And then Jo Wiley came out in the media and talked about her experiences as a carer for her sister who has a learning disability. And the vaccination categories at that time gave priority to carers but not to people with a learning disability. Priority group six was for people with a profound or severe learning disability. And if anybody's checked the coding recently on people's records, those codes don't tend to be used. The actual variability of coding meant that a lot of times people who were clinically vulnerable and also had a learning disability weren't coded properly to be identified as such. So Jo got called up to get a vaccine as her sister's carer before her sister was called up for a vaccine. And actually by the time her sister got her appointment for a vaccine, she already had COVID and was seriously ill from it. <coughs> so I hope you see why the need is there to talk about this group. And now to think about why I talk about breaking the cycle. My research has focused at the top mostly in clinical practice and looking at doing things differently in primary care. However, I'm now researching more into the field where the researchers are doing the recruitment, applying capacity assessments, taking consent, and also looking at ethical approval in research. And so this is a, a talk of two halves to some degree, going through the kind of trajectory of the work I've been doing. And I like to think that means there's something for everyone. So I hope that you agree. But before I start, I want to talk about the literal and metaphorical elephant in the room. And that is that, first of all, health inequalities are not a result of one or two clinical decisions made. They're not a result of a researcher excluding or including. They are economic, they are social, and they are political. And we can do what we can, but there is a much wider issue going on here. Equally, I'm asking of you something different in the way you practice clinically, in the way you conduct your research. And I realize that to some degree, as Laura Sheard and Rosemary Peacock pointed out, it feels a bit like fiddling while Rome burns when we do these studies and we talk about clinical changes because we are a system that is overstretched. We are a group of people that is overworked. And a lot of us are experiencing feelings of burnout while being told that we're back to business as usual. And I don't want to add to that burden by asking you to do more. But seeing as our theme is recovery and innovation, and we do want to see recovery, and we do want to do things differently, I'm asking you that if you are going to innovate, if you are going to do things differently, think about this group. I know things give in this system when we're all overworked, but don't let it be for this group who have been failed so many times before. I'm going to suggest that we work a bit differently 
in the hope that if we do this upstream, things will improve downstream. It might save you clinically missed appointments. It might help your recruitment into studies. So I can't promise you an improved system because the problem is too entrenched. It's too big for all of us here. But I can ask you to make incremental changes. So I'm going to take diabetes management as my exemplar of um, a long-term condition management in primary care that could be improved. So Giles Glover and Felicity Everson found that people with a learning disability were being admitted to hospital for what they were calling ambulatory care sensitive conditions, things that really could have been taken care of in the primary care setting that had got out of control and were causing hospital admissions. And as they say in their summary, in the easy read version of their report, when this happens a lot, we have to ask how good care is outside hospital. And one of the conditions, amongst others, that they found people were coming into hospital for was complications of diabetes. So I'm going to take you on something of a whistle-stop tour through the work I've been doing at the University of Leeds, beginning with the NIHR-funded um, OK Diabetes Feasibility Trial. And the feasibility trial we tried to run was with type 2 diabetics who had a learning disability. Now, you would think we have two registers, one for diabetes, one for learning disability. Combine them both, and you have your recruitment population. But actually, it's not that simple. We have found that even though anybody over the age of 14 can be eligible to go on the learning disability register, only about 25% of people who are eligible are on that register. And there's a mixture of reasons why, but one of the main reasons is that they're not coded properly in childhood, and as they transition into adulthood, those codes don't carry through. They have no meaning to this register. And then no one is having those follow-up conversations with them about whether they want to be on the learning disability register. So coding is really variable. And it's a real problem, not only for research, but also for people qualifying for what they're entitled to. So being correctly coded means it goes on your summary record. On your referrals, it's often flagged automatically, not always. That's a, a whole extra problem as well. But the question is, whose job is it to code? If you see somebody with a learning disability in front of you and they don't have a code on their record, are you going to be the one that has that conversation with them? Or are you going to hope that one of your colleagues will do it or that there's somebody with a special interest who might do it? Is there anybody you can task or do you just leave it because you've got to get on? And I think most of the time, because we're so pressured, you don't want to get into it, so you skip it for the next time. Or you know they've got a learning disability. You make the reasonable adjustments for them, but it doesn't get recorded. And yet, obviously, if they have a code for learning disability, they get a health check. They get a diabetes care plan, and they qualify for a vaccine priority group, which was one of the big problems we found during COVID. Equally, I should add that diagnostic codes like Down syndrome do not put a person on the register. So we searched um, one CCG's records and found 16 people with codes for Down syndrome on their record who were not on the learning disability register. So that's another one to have a look at. There's a great list um, on that NHS document about the codes that you can search for that do not put somebody on a learning disability register but are codes for learning disability. And there are many, I might add. So in OK Diabetes, we spoke to 177 people with type 2 di well, with diabetes and a learning disability. We actually only carried 147 through to the trial because the other 30 had type 1 diabetes and neither they nor their carers knew that there were different types of diabetes or what that might mean. So they'd referred themselves into the study and, um, and had no idea that they didn't qualify for it. So that flagged something for us about people's understanding of their own diabetes. Now, equally, we found that one in five people had no help at all. And when you look at this group, you expect that they have carers. You expect that they would have support workers because they have certain needs that they would really struggle through our systems and our everyday life processes. And yet, 20% had no one to help them with it, no one to navigate, no one to advocate for them. 
And so that's worth bearing in mind when you see people. Are these your 20% who actually have no one but you to advocate for them? Um, the other thing was the mobile phone use. This was an older group because it was type 2 diabetes. But I have to say, when I asked them if they had a mobile phone, even though we've got 58% here, when I said it, a lot of people kind of went to a drawer and dusted off a Nokia 3210, the kind that you play snake on. And they said, I've got this, but I never use it, but it's for emergencies. So we're not talking about regular smart user, smartphone users in this age group. We're talking about people who have a kind of low digital literacy. Now, I know some people with learning disabilities who are super whizzy on Facebook and the internet, but this older group didn't seem to really know how to navigate the internet. And certainly, 26% went on the internet when we asked them, and of those, a third needed help to do that. So any idea we had about recruitment through the internet would immediately bias what we were doing. Any interventions delivered purely through <coughs> smartphone means would bias the results. And so purely web-based services and interventions will bias the results against this group who just don't have neither the data nor the experience of using digital equipment. Now, pandemic again may have changed this. I have seen people getting online who were never online before, but they're still needing support to do it. They're not independent internet users. So then what else we saw actually, just interestingly, was that their diabetes wasn't that badly controlled in relation to the type two population but we saw high levels of overweight and obesity. We saw a lot of inactivity. We saw people getting things and fetching things for people to make their lives easier because they were hard enough and actually disempowering them to do exercise a lot of the time. We saw an overprescribing of antipsychotics again and, um, and people without a medication review going years back. And when we talked to them about exercise and when we talked about how they might become more active. They told us about hate crime. They told us about violence. They told us it wasn't safe for them to walk out of their own homes because of the crime and the hate crime and the experiences of bullying that they got from the people in their areas. And when we told them, well, when we asked them, could you get a bus? Could you get a taxi? Could you? They told us about their financial means and how it just wasn't possible to do that because they had spent all their money on taking a taxi to the shops or on going to their only social encounter. And we realized that you cannot give generic health information to this group without actually working through with them. What would that mean if I get you a subscription to your local sports club? Would you be able to take it? And we really hadn't considered safety as something. I think we have an awareness that people with a disability experience maybe more violence, maybe more crime in their lives. But what was striking was that at the 177, so many talked to me about violence. So many women talked to me about sexual violence, saying that they would never be referred to the LGI in Leeds because they had experienced sexual violence in Leeds City Centre. Not just one or two isolated cases. This was a lot of people. And we, weren't, we didn't have a CRF for it to record it for our trial because we didn't think we'd encounter it. And then coming back to their kind of day-to-day -day patterns, a lot of them were drinking full sugar fizzy drinks and having eight sugars in their tea. And we talked to them about diabetes and sugar. And they said, yeah, I know, I know, I can't have biscuits and chocolate. But they're not a group, and I don't want to generalize, but if you give them generic health information, they can't extrapolate it to their everyday practices. And that is why education can only go so far unless it's bespoke. And it comes back to the same thing. You can give exercise information, but unless you go bespoke, it's not going to work. And the other thing that we noted was even though we're increasingly seeing the links between dental health and diabetes and poorer diabetes outcomes for people with poor dental health, people were not going to the dentist and this was not being checked on or followed up. And the other thing we noticed, support workers. Um, I don't want to dis support workers because they have a, a really tough job, but their level of understanding of diabetes was at times distinctly worrying. So I went to see a lady living in a shared house where there was a staff member living there 24-7 and six other people with a learning disability, each with their own bedrooms. 
and she had lost two toes and it had impaired her mobility, so she was no longer really getting around, lost her balance. And the support worker said, well, that's just what happens, isn't it? I thought people with diabetes just lost toes. And she saw this as a normal trajectory for the disease. And that really had highlighted to us that we thought the support workers were going to be the advocates for healthy eating and for exercise, and they lack the understanding of how diabetes works and what you can do about it. So, in practice, in general practice, we found a clear desire to make reasonable adjustments, but a lack of understanding about what to do first, where to go for it, what makes a difference. And we also found a lot of people telling us, well, I haven't had specific training, so I can't do that. I can't work with people with learned disabilities. I can't be the one to implement the reasonable adjustments. And so we thought at the end of this trial, what are we going to do about this? Because publishing in journals and writing our lovely monograph for the NIHR is not going to get us where we need to go with this information. And also we created a beautiful type 2 leaflet because we figured if we can't be better than a leaflet, then our intervention's not worth trialing out. So we give everybody a leaflet, and it's actually widely used now by, um, by people in learning disability services. But apparently, the drawings are too ugly. This is the feedback I've had, and they don't like it. So um, we tried to make everybody prettier in our next one. So you'll see that in a minute. <laughs> so we bid to the Health Foundation for the Remain Project. We said we want to put evidence into practice. We want to create resources that will make commissioners sit up and start thinking about people with learning disabilities in their services. We want to create resources for clinicians who are struggling to make reasonable adjustments. So that's what we did. So we worked with this wonderful project reference group at Easy on the Eye, and I put the link in there because they have a free image bank of Easy Read images. And they're increasing what they've got every day. You can also contact them for a bespoke image and you can make your own easy read, which is better than nothing. The easy read out there is variable in quality, possibly because all of us are making our own. But as I say, it's better than nothing if you need to create something bespoke for someone. The image bank is there, and it's free. And they do actually work for other NHS trusts if you get in touch with them. And we created a website with Diabetes UK, and we put all the information and tools we had on it, for um, care for people with a learning disability. And in the first year, we got 15,000 page visits, 18,000 downloads, and it continues to be a well-used page. So there is a need there for people to access inf information. And the other thing I might add is we employed someone to do our social media and our marketing, which is not a skill set that tends to exist within academics. And it was really good to get someone who actually knew what they were doing. And I think that is one of the reasons why the reach is so good on this. So we produced a how to make reasonable adjustments guide. And that is available for download. Your practice can run through it. It gives you ideas for where you might want to make reasonable adjustments and how to go about it. The other really popular download was the communication tips. And at first, this sort of confused us a bit, but actually we realized that that is one of the main concerns is communicating with people with a learning disability. And part of that is because people with learning disabilities do have a lot of communication problems. So we've got the comorbidities often found in this population, including respiratory disease, epilepsy, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy, dementia, schizophrenia, anxiety and depression we found a lot of in our diabetes population. But 40% of people have hearing problems, and up to 90% of people can have communication problems. And so it is something to think about. And this is why justification for double appointments is clear, because communication isn't going to be easy, but it is something you can do if you work with the person and their supporter. So... One of the things that we all sometimes feel a bit awkward about is asking someone if they have a learning disability or asking them if they can read or what information they need. Um, but I asked 177 people if they had a learning disability and if they could read, and not one of them got offended. One person got offended that we had cartoons because they were for children, but no one got offended that I was asking these questions. So this is a, a cringy transcript of me asking someone if they can read. 
So I say to her, so are you all right reading things or do you? And she goes, eh? I said, can you read all right or do you usually get someone else? She goes, yeah, I can read enough to get around. And I waited and she went, got hard words, no. And I said, got you, okay. So if you get a letter through the post, do you get help finding out what it says? And she said, yeah, the support workers do that. And she gestured to this pile on the side and they were all NHS labeled letters that had been unread because the support worker hadn't been that week. And they looked like there were a few others, I don't know, tax bills. They were recognizable headings that she knew meant they were important. They weren't junk mail, but she couldn't read them herself. So when somebody DNAs to an appointment, it might be that they are just not understanding the letter. And when I was working in practice, I have seen some terrible generic letters. You know, every long-term condition is listed, and you may be one of them. And if you are somebody with kidney disease, bring a urine sample. If you're somebody with diabetes, bring your monitor. And, if you're, and you have to sift your way through to your own condition. I mean, they're impossible for her to read. And she will need help. And a telephone call probably could have done the job a lot better. So she didn't get offended at that. No one's ever got offended. Like, some people don't want to be labeled disabled. It's quite interesting, actually. When you ask them if they have a learning disability, they associate disability often with physical disability. But if you explain to them what a learning disability register is and who it's for, they'll go, oh, yeah, I guess that is me then. And it seems to work well, but it's a conversation and it takes time, and I appreciate that. So there is one way to facilitate the conversation, which is through the Learning Disability Register Inclusion Tool. So there's an amazing health facilitation team up in Leeds, and they put all of this online for free um, under the title Get Me Better Leeds. And this is a checklist you can run through with a person to see if they should be on the register. So it takes the conversation out of your hands and onto a piece of paper, which makes it a lot less confrontational. So then, once we'd made the inclusion, uh, once we'd made the reasonable adjustments work, once we'd put it all online, we wanted to evaluate if it actually worked. And we were very lucky that the British Medical Association and Leeds Community Healthcare Trust wanted that too. So they funded us to do Real D which is Reasonable Adjustments for Learning Disability and Diabetes. And we went out and we looked at the care pathways of people with a learning disability and we interviewed staff and we interviewed people with a learning disability getting their diabetes checks. And these are the participant quotes from staff. So when we asked, you see somebody with a learning disability in front of you, they've got no code on their record, what do you do? They said, I'm sure someone else will code for that. I'm sure that's somebody else's job, but I'm not sure who. And we asked who you would task, and they said, I don't know. But someone will pick it up. It'll be okay. <coughs> so there was no responsibility being taken for that task, unfortunately, unless a practice was under audit for it at that time, or, you know, they had a lead for LD, which in our sample we didn't find, but wider conversations have. There was a lot of assumptions about what services people could go to. Could they go to diabetes education? Could they go to weight management? They said, I don't think they'd be able to cope with that. But those services have to make reasonable adjustments. That's part of their obligation under the Equality Act. And so it's not necessarily the right thing to do to block a person's referral to those services on the basis you don't think it can be reasonably adjusted enough for them. You have to enter into a conversation with that service, really. And then we got, we always do that for Bob, but that's because we know him. So a reasonable adjustment was always made for Bob. We knew what he needed, but it was not recorded anywhere. And so when Bob got suddenly admitted to hospital, there was nothing on his record to tell them how to work with him. And it was done on this basis of everybody knew Bob, so it was okay. But actually, it's not that helpful if you're not writing it down. Looking at the referral into the community diabetes team, they had no idea this person had a learning disability because referral forms don't state anything. They didn't state what that person needed. So they spent the first appointment trying to work out what the person needed, what support they wanted, if this was really the right thing for them. And it wasted everybody's time because the referral wasn't clear enough. Talking about easy read information for appointment letters, 
there is a problem with our systems as well. It's not just our clinical interactions. The whole system, the referral forms, they're too long. We can't add in a bit about disability. We can't add in a bit about reasonable adjustments. And so we have a system-wide problem as well. It's not just individuals. We need to think bigger than that. So in summary, Code for Learning Disabilities, go to the Diabetes UK website. The reasonable adjustment stuff is transferable for all long-term conditions, really. Um, make reasonable adjustments if you can and use easy read resources. And then we move on to the second half, which is more about the research process. So we wanted to think about this idea of making informed choices, helping people to make good choices about their diabetes. And this is where we introduced EDICT, which was about enabling diabetes informed consent. How can you be in a diabetes trial if you don't know what it is or why you should care about managing it? So we wanted to create the guide, which I loosely title, Why Should I Care I Have Diabetes? And we wanted to do it through co-production. So we wanted to work with Voiceability and Change, which are two organizations that work with people with learning disabilities. And we wanted to disrupt the power dynamics of me as the expert in the room. We wanted to capacity build in those two groups to help them understand research, because it was alien to them. We paid them properly for their work, which is really important. And we fed back what we'd done in the end. We actually fed back at multiple iterations. So how do you make a workshop interesting for several hours online? Well, what you do is dress as a pirate, which is my main advice here. And um, I was actually doing a role play where I dressed as a doctor, so I had like classic stethoscope. The children's um, dress-up box came in handy at this point. But then I needed to dress as a care worker, and I didn't have anything, so I dressed as a pirate instead. And um, that seemed to work quite well, and it definitely disrupted the power of me as an academic expert, because they all thought I was a lunatic instead. Or <laughs> and, um, and they enjoyed it a bit more. It broke it up a bit, you know. And, um, and I don't think any... It's, it's a skill to do co-production. It's a skill to reach out to the public and interact with them. And not everyone can rock an eye patch like this. So um, I do think that if you don't have that skill, it's OK. But we need to then see it as a skill. We need to reward the people who have that skill and pay them fairly, both in public and in our own staff, in academic staff. And we need to cost them into our grants to be part of them. And then, it sounds like a bit of a segue, but it sort of makes sense as you go. I went to the WHO. And, um, and the World Health Organization is currently writing its global report on disability and health. And I've been part of the group that's writing that, doing the evidence base. And most of the information is embargoed until December the 4th when the report launches and I get my life back. But one, well, two key things are coming out of the report. Number one is that globally, one of the main barriers to accessing good health care is the attitudes of healthcare workers. And that is the same for low, middle, and high-income countries. This is not a global south issue. This is for all of us. People assuming that services aren't right, that somebody has no quality of life, that women with a disability or men with a disability don't need sexual and reproductive health. These assumptions are being made everywhere, not sending people for smear tests, if they have a disability. Just, it comes up in all different departments of healthcare, but it comes up in primary care in the global north as well. We are not exempt from this attitudinal barrier. And I think we need to think about what are we doing in medical education to combat these attitudes. We need to start combating them from the start with our students and then working through our workforce. And secondly, poor data. You may have noticed I harp on a bit about coding. And we are actually, as the UK, held up as an exemplar of a country who record well for learning disability. But that is in comparison to others, not because we're actually doing it all that well. So the COVID data really set the conversation going globally about the health of people with learning disabilities in COVID. But we could do better. If we're only recording 25% of the people, that means we're missing so many people's lives and deaths that we need to record. And our research evidence is the same. We're not showing if things work. 
with people with a disability because we're not recording it in our research participants. And so this takes me to the second part of the cycle, which is much shorter, don't worry, because I've only just begun it. So looking in the field, looking at approvals and ethics. So we know that people with a learning disability are, on average, they receive mainstream healthcare. They receive the treatments, the interventions, like everybody else. Very few of them go into specialist services. And yet, they are not the usual participants in our health research. They're often blocked from participating in health research because things are deemed too difficult for them to understand or take part in, or that their capacity is not good enough to give informed consent. And unless we change the way we do research, we will continue to create an evidence base that misses them out that doesn't test the acceptability or the efficacy of certain things on them. And so in 2013, this was the state of play as Feldman found it, that 90% of studies on a trawl through one particular registry were excluding people with a learning disability. And in actual fact, they think that with small adjustments, 70% of those studies could have included people with a learning disability. They could have been part of that evidence base. And I can tell you from working with them in research, people want to be part of research. They want to give something back. And they want to understand what we need from them so that they can participate in something greater than themselves. So this is something that a lot of them would be very positive about if they got the opportunity. So there is implications that the tide is turning in terms of the commitment of funders. So we have a blog about MRC research and why involving the public is necessary. And actually within this blog, it talks about asking the questions differently. Don't think my public consultation can't understand the stats. It means you're not explaining the stats. It means you're not asking the relevant questions to your public. Try and think differently. And again, it comes back to a skill set. We've also got a change in the NIHR strategy. They're now talking about bringing research to people in their communities, building relationships of trust over time, and enabling voices to be heard that previously had not been heard in research. And this is a really important one for me because it indicates a plan to change the funding structure, which is part of the problem of why we can't do good consultation with the public a lot of the time. So the NIHR has also changed its name. It's now social care as well. And it's been offering a lot of its trials the chance to bid for more money for a social care arm. And who receives social care? Well, quite a lot of people with learning disabilities do, especially the older type 2 population. So um, this is right up my street in terms of looking at inclusion for this group in research. And actually, I'm part of the Respect PC study at Warwick University, where we now have a co-production arm funded by this new strategy by the NIHR to work with people with a learning disability about emergency care planning. So equally, the NIHR is putting its money where its mouth is, or at least this is the, the change in things, and they're launching a new program grant fund for working in community partnerships and for sustainable public participation. And the awards want named contributors from the public on the grant. They want collaboration that will go beyond grants. So there's definitely a thirst for it now in funding. So this is where my new research comes in, which is capacity, consent, and autonomy, health research participation for people with a learning disability. And it's Wellcome Trust funded. And it's still in field work, so I can't say too much, but I have been sitting in NHS um, rec committees watching the approval process. I've been interviewing researchers who do recruitment, and already there are a few things that I'm seeing which make for an interesting conversation. So we need to think about inclusion in these four ways, and we need to think about it in research design. So I pick on the direct trial, and then I cringe every time I do this because I worry that they're going to be in the um, audience. But the reason why I pick on this trial, which showed a result, I might add, was that in their protocol, which got past ethics, they have an exclusion for learning difficulties, which is interesting because that tends to include dyslexia and ADHD, and it's wider than learning disabilities. Um, and it also has 
a requirement for signed informed consent, which I have to say I haven't asked for in a very long time. I do an option for verbal consent. Ethics always lets me. So um, I think we also sometimes put in boilerplate text that's not necessarily the right thing for our participants. Um, but this got through ethical approval. And, um, and I do wish that I had seen that one to hear the discussion about that criteria. But actually, from what I've seen, I imagine there was no discussion. Because what I'm seeing time and time again is studies that look a lot like this, and they say does not have capacity to consent. That's the exclusion criteria. But in the protocol, they don't mention who's going to assess that or how it's going to be done. Um, I quite like a bit more detail given the others, like lacking decision capacity in relation to diet or preparing meals. That's quite specific, but it doesn't actually tell us how they're going to measure that or who's going to measure that. And then we've got without cognitive impairment or with mild cognitive impairment according to mini mental state exams. And, and I think part of the other problem is we don't have standardized ways of assessing this stuff. So everybody's making it up as they go along. And what I see when I see ethical review is I see a 25-page information sheet with six pages on GDPR and a group understanding that no one's ever going to read that. And yet when you put it in front of a person with low literacy or with a learning disability, we suddenly go, oh, you don't have capacity to consent. And we exclude them. And yet we're all participating in this myth that people are going to read these things. And we're not trying to make our research more accessible. And again, it's a problem with the system. Because if you don't do six pages on GDPR, you get knocked back. So what do you do? And so that's why I'm thinking about inclusion in terms of ethical approval. Because it needs to come. It needs to happen. Now, I have to say, I used to love the question that they had on the IRS form, which said, are you going to recruit anyone with a mental illness or a learning disability? And if your study wasn't on that, if you were recruiting a diabetic population, you'd go, no, no, I'm not. And you'd just pretend that you could recruit 100 people with diabetes and not get a single person with a learning disability or a mental illness. Because if you tick that box, it opened up like all these drop-down menus, and you didn't want that. And so you're like, no, we don't need to think about the risks associated with those groups. I won't have them. But we kind of built a myth to support that system that that wasn't what our population looked like. And sadly, that question, uh, that topic has gone, and I never got a screenshot of it. So um, I'm very sad about that. But the idea remains that we have legislation for people who lack capacity, and we know what we're doing with people who have capacity. But if somebody's capacity is up for question, they fall into this gray ethical area where a lot of us aren't very comfortable dealing with them. And I know clinicians have to assess capacity to make certain decisions. So they're a bit more comfortable. But we don't tend to send our clinicians out into the research field. We tend to send our grade sixes and our grade sevens into the research field, you know, post PhD or pre PhD, and go off and assess capacity in whatever way you feel. And, um, and that's where we're actually asking quite a lot of a group of people because we haven't collectively decided what we're doing about this. And I think part of it is we picture a kind of standard recruited sample, which looks a lot like your kind of first in human studies with your young, white, healthy males. And actually, that's not the population that is using primary care, that we actually need to be trialing our interventions on or asking the opinions of. And we've got a bit of... Uh, a kind of, is it cognitive dissonance, where we all pretend the system's okay, but actually it's massively flawed and we all know it. And, um, and so we really need to return to things like the Mental Capacity Act, because we have the legislation. You have to start from the assumption that the person has capacity. I think that's one of the things that's missing with this population. And then, going back to that six pages on GDPR, you have to show that you've made every effort to support them to make a decision themselves. And so have we really made every effort, if that's what we're giving people? And how accessible is our information for most people? And assessments of capacity should be time and decision specific. So when I've recruited through gatekeepers, a lot of people try and do me a favor. And they say, no, no, don't get that person. They lack capacity. And they're giving a blanket statement about that person's capacity. And they're trying not to upset that person and to waste my time. And I get that. 
because actually it's a really big deal when a researcher comes around your house and makes an appointment to see you, and then if she decides you lack capacity and she walks away, she might cause you quite a bit of distress, so I get that, but it needs to be a conversation about exactly what we're asking of them and whether they could do that, because so many carers have told me, he won't be able to do that, he won't be able to take part in that, and actually they could in the end. So there's too much gatekeeping, it looks more like paternalism a lot of the time, so, can a person understand the information? Can they retain it for as long as they need to? Can they weigh up the pros and cons? And can they communicate their response? And that communication can be verbal, it can be a squeeze of the hand, a tap of an option on a, a piece of paper, it can be multiple things. Don't take communication to mean just one thing. And we need our research staff to understand this and to be able to work with this. And we need a research environment where it's okay to say, I'm not comfortable with this, or I know you want me to recruit 10 people today, but I just don't think it's okay in this case. Could we have a conversation? And I think they're under a lot of pressure, a lot of our researchers, and we're driving research forward constantly, and there isn't that space to talk about these things and reflect on them. And so that is why I want to think about inclusion in the field as well. Now, I have been told, I can't help you recruit people with a learning disability, I haven't had any training. And that really worried me. I offered that person training, and they said, uh, no, you're all right. Um, but if 2% of your primary care population has a learning disability, then you're going to encounter them. Like when I did my first ever diabetes study, we had two people with a learning disability, and we only recruited 48 people. So you're going to come across them and they may want to be part of that study. You don't need specific training, but you may want to improve your skills in communication. You may want to change the way you write your information sheets now that you realize who it's going to. So researchers need confidence and they need to be able to have those conversations and explain that they're not confident, but they can't hide behind this defense that they need special training because it's just not true. So as I say, most people said to me, you won't find any people with learning disability because they're all in specialist services. But actually, if you saw the criteria to get into specialist services, the multiple comorbidities you must have on top of your learning disability to get into that really pressed system, you would realize they're not there. And actually, they're probably bouncing into the referral system and straight back out. And they'll do that over and over again. This is what we were finding in our projects. So in an average practice, you've got about 120 people with a learning disability on the register, and about 10 will have diabetes. So just think about the populations that you are recruiting and whether they actually look like that. And then finally, we need to think about inclusion in terms of PPI. Because we have a saying, uh, a rule, um, something we repeat over and over again in disability studies, and it's nothing about us without us. No research into disability without the participation of people with a disability. And that doesn't mean participation as the subjects of the research, but it means at all stages of the research. And a history of marginalization and paternalism has meant that this has not been happening in our research. And it actually means that when you do good PPI and you do good stakeholder engagement, you are doing a political act. You are addressing that inequality at the start of your research. So people need to be valued and they need to be integral parts of research. And you need to go to them at each stage and say, what would you think if you were recruited this way? How would you react if you were given this measure? And you will find a lot of the time that they'll say, I can't answer that. That's not appropriate, you can't interview me for an hour on that topic, that's ridiculous. Or you can't ask me to come to this place without providing transport. And you get these insights that you wouldn't otherwise get and your recruitment will fall apart. And equally, if you think, well, I'm not recruiting people with disabilities, I'm doing a diabetes study. Um, you do still need to hear those voices, as I think I've made a case for, because they are still going to be recruited by you if you don't have recruitment bias towards certain groups. So it's a whole separate talk on how you do good PPI. But one of my big things is paying people. And that's why I'm so pleased to see the NIHR talking about funding 
because people need to be paid from the start, even in that kind of collaborative discussion about the research. And you need to think about transport for people. Think about paying for a carer or a support worker to come with them in the case of people with learning disabilities, because often they can't navigate coming on their own. And you need to make it task specific. No point getting them to sit in a three hour steering committee while you all argue about stratification. It's not worth their time, it's not worth anybody's time. It needs to be where they are and what they want to know. And so many times we get it wrong because it's just easier to recruit the usual subjects and, um, and just ask them what they think. So really, I've addressed a lot of these, but these are what I see as the structural and attitudinal barriers to inclusion in PPI. The community engagement that we want to do seems to end as soon as our researchers who we asked to do it finish their fixed term contracts. And we have no continuity because it was them that built the links and then they go and they move on to another project. And the funding structure that we ask so much of these organizations a lot of the time before we get the money. And they don't understand that we get so little of what we actually apply for. We waste our time, but it's not fair to waste their time. We need bridging funding to maintain these links, both for our staff and for our groups. And we need public engagement built in to our grants, not as an add-on. And we need to know more about tax and benefits because the amount of times I've seen people saying, I'm not going to pay people with learning disabilities because they're all on benefits and I don't know if it'll interfere with it. And it's just embarrassing now. We need to actually get a handle on this. And as I've said before, PPI consultation is an expertise it's an expertise in our workforce and it's an expertise in the public. And we need to recognize that and bring people in to do it. And what if you don't do it? Well, have you heard of the Spectrum 10K study? So Spectrum 10K was a study for people, um, autistic people, and they were happily recruiting after doing some public consultation, getting some big names to support the study. and. Um, the autistic community decided that they were not very happy with what was being done with their genetic data. They were not very happy with the credentials of some of the team. And they saw that there might be an argument for a cure for autism coming out of this study rather than really understanding the lives of autistic people. And so they launched a counter campaign on Twitter called Boycott Spectrum 10K. And individuals, organizations, bloggers, all sorts got together and they formed a huge campaign and they shut Spectrum 10K down mid-recruitment. So now Spectrum 10K is in consultation with groups. It's hired um, an independent advisory group to manage that consultation and they are hoping to relaunch again once those problems have been addressed. But it killed a huge project because it wasn't the right people they consulted was with it wasn't the right voices as far as I can tell. It's a whole separate research project in itself what happened to Spectrum 10K. But we see that it can happen if we're not careful. And so think inclusion in the way you do research so that we're not repeating the problems of the past. Because learning disability is not a death sentence. It's a diagnosis that 2% of the population have and unless we change the way we care for people and the way we do our research, we will continue to perpetuate that health inequality. And actually, these inequalities are growing for this group. We've seen this in COVID. We're going to see more data coming out, as a measure to show me today. And we need to stem that tide of inequality. And we need to make sure that they get back the days of lost life that they have a right to. So thank you. Can you hear it okay? It says it's on. Yeah. Josh can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Amy. Any questions? We've got a roving mic, I think, somewhere. Mm. Do we need yeah. two roving mics? So, if you can pop the hand up. Um, the microphone will come to you, and you can introduce yourself. So. While, while we're waiting, Amy, I think mm -hmm. um, that, that um, comment about uh, healthcare professionals saying, you know, oh, no, I've not been trained. It's alive and kicking, 
uh, and quite a common problem that we face, mm -hmm. particularly with the trying to work across healthcare and systems. Yeah. So uh, mm -hmm. the new teams that have been created in the community mm -hmm. who suddenly say, oh, no, what, we've never had any training. Oh, I wouldn't know how mm -hmm. to look after somebody with learning disability. is a real problem. Yeah. And, I mean, we are getting the mandatory Oliver McGowan training. So soon no one will have that excuse <laughs> because there is going to be a rollout of mandatory training. But I think it's... Training only goes so far, doesn't it? It introduces a new idea to you, and then unless you use it regularly, you, you can't really stick with it. It's more about the reasonable adjustments to make the conditions right to have the conversations, to work with people, to get into their lives. And training can't buy you that because that's reasonable adjustments. You know. Training doesn't change attitudes necessarily. Unless yeah. it's mandatory training, people mm -hmm. go, oh, not more. You've mm -hmm. got a question about that. Yeah. Hi, Amy. It's Richard McManus from Oxford. Thank you very much for the, the talk, which I really enjoyed. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, a lot of the things that you were saying about um, consent seem, um, I do, um, part of my research is in stroke, and mm. very, very similar issues. And I wonder whether there are things that might be learned um, in acquired problems where, um, uh, where there are similar issues, particularly around that consent thing, because I know um, in stroke that, that you, you can do a lot of work on it, a lot of work to get people involved, but you, if you're not very careful, you end up getting the very mild people, the people who, who essentially are very similar to, to the normal uh, mm -hmm. population. But I, I wonder if you might comment about the potential. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, uh, the first study that we were in, it was um, people with a mild to moderate learning disability and type 2 diabetes. And, um, and that was done based on this group will have the capacity to self-manage so that's why we're going to have them. And that kind of phrase stuck in a lot of what we did, this mild to moderate, even though no one really thinks of themselves like that, people really aren't coded like that. And it's quite right. Then you start excluding a group who maybe have the more profound versions of stroke or the, you know, profound outcomes. And, um, and you're not trying to think of different ways to involve them. I have to say, MENCAP's got a really good section on its website about involving people with profound and multiple disabilities. And, um, and it is about thinking of other ways to get people to answer questions and respond and really not taking a lack of communication as a lack of capacity. I think that's a big one, isn't it? That so often, that's why a squeeze of the hand can be an indication of consent as long as you are able to ascertain that they've had some time to think about it, weighed up the pros and cons. And I think the other thing is we see this idea of consent and capacity is binary, like you either do or you don't, and you say yes and that's it. And people make decisions in dialogue with their carers and their partners, and they might feel like it one day, and then the next day I come and interview them and they just get up and walk off. And, um, and it makes you realize that it's an ongoing process of checking and rechecking and establishing what you're going to do that day. Because it's decision specific, isn't it? Great talk, thanks. Um, I'm Rachel Spencer from Warwick. Um, I had, can you comment on any experiences you might have had about using paired informal carers' details in the general practice record to access populations that have reduced capacity? Okay. <laughs> so um, what we found was when we were trying to do recruitment, there was sometimes, very rarely, named carers. And then when you tried to contact the number was gone or it was out of date. Um, it tended to be if you had an organization, you could get in touch with them. And we had, an ability, we had ethical approval to recruit through organizations. So then you could go to them and say, we are aware that you have some people in your care who qualify for this study. But actual paired records, we found very few. Um, we really, like, it, that would be more suitable for families, I assume. And it, it really wasn't present in the records we were finding. And when we did recruit people through um, like one means without consultation with their family, even if it was an adult who gave full consent, families got very upset with us if we didn't then go to them. And, um, and so we did have to take this kind of dyadic consent from the pair, even though really that's not, it was never our intention to do that. So we did have to adapt as we worked, yeah. It was... Um, 
it was a lot harder to recruit and that is why we fell behind massively. And then um, next time we bid for a grant, we bid properly with the right amount of money built in to do that kind of recruitment and we were told it was far too expensive. Mm. So <laughs> we learned a lesson but I'm not sure that lesson was heard and carried through. Yeah, um, hi, uh, David Blaine from Glasgow. R really fantastic talk, Amy, and I think lots of parallels with researchers doing work w with a range of other marginalized groups. Um, I wondered about the ethics piece uh, mm. and, and whether there was any work going on or, or training even of, of ethics mm. committees to, to make this kind of more streamlined or, or, or sort of simplified pa patient information leaflets, for instance. Mm -hmm. So there's Mental Capacity Act training for ethics committees, and that's always done, but that really focuses on do they have or do they lack capacity. Then recently at an event for HRA members, um, the Ascent study went there. I don't know if anybody's heard of Ascent, but they're looking at people with impaired communication for a variety of reasons, and they talked about communicating to gain consent, and, um, and it was a kind of interest talk, pseudo training thing for people. So there, it wasn't formally built into the structure. But um, the ethics committees do this thing where they get a template application that raises an ethical question and they have to work through it. And I saw one the other day about um, involving women who are pregnant in trials and the committee discussed it and they raised some really interesting points about it. And then the next month I went to them and they had a trial that could have involved pregnant women, but it didn't, exclude them and nobody mentioned it. And so that I'm kind of wondering how the heck I actually change anything in the HRA because the ideas I had have been done and they didn't work. And, um, and when I talk to HRA members, they say things like, well, we could add another bit to the form. We could increase the length of IRAS. <laughs> I think, no, please don't. Please. And, um, and I think it's a reliance on those systems that kind of dichotomize a lot of the time that cause our problems. So I don't have an answer, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> just one mic. <laughs> ah, we've got a question at the back, haven't we? Just getting the steps in. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I'm Rachel Snow Miller, and I work for NHS England. Please don't do all at once. Um, and I work on the Leader Program, which some of you may have heard of, some of you may not. Um, so if you haven't, Leader is a service improvement program. Local systems look at the deaths of people with a learning disability from February this year, people who are autistic, and it's about trying to make local service improvements to prevent premature mortality of people with learning disability and autistic people. So. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, so I am absolutely fascinated the w with your work, Amy. It's great, um, and I really want to spend loads of time talking to you. But a couple of things. Um, interestingly, we're also interested in NHS England about this lack of engagement of people with a learning disability in research. Mm. And this has come from some of our experts with experience who work with us. So in all of the national team project teams, we have people with learning disability and um, or autistic people. And actually, they've been saying to us, well, why are people with a learning disability excluded? And um, we are potentially going to be engaging with NIHR, potentially through DHSC, mm -hmm. to talk to them directly about what we could do. Um, so I'm hoping that that <coughs> might make a little bit of headway. I don't know if it will or not, but it might be that we could have a conversation um, and if anybody else is interested in that, I'd be really interested in hearing your views as well. Um, and I also wanted to say to people, every area that you live in will have self-advocacy groups. So they are groups of people with a learning disability who come together, they're self-empowerment groups. Many of those people may have been in long-stay institutions. We're down the road from Calder Stones here. It's quite infamous. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, there's a self-advocacy group that is from Calder Stones people in this area. Um, those self-advocacy groups are 
amazing people who are just desperate to get involved and engaged with anything you want to talk to them about, whether it's about what it feels like to be a person with a learning disability, not living as long as people who don't have a learning disability, or what it's like to engage with GP services, or how to get access to um, any other community service, leisure service, or whatever. Just reach out and find your local self-advocacy groups because they will desperately want to talk to you. And um, there was something else that I wanted to talk to you about. I can't remember what it was, but I'm... I'm absolutely delighted that somebody is looking at this and taking it forward from an academic perspective as well as from a policy perspective in NHS England because we can only actually get so far and actually academics working and pushing as well is, is fascinating, so thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that I have enjoyed listening to you and there's a lot to take away home. But I, on the light side, I want to ask an inequality question. <laughs> but more seriously, I'm looking at the topic you have up there. A woman with a learning disability is likely to die on average of 18 years. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering whether that applies directly to men too. Uh, well, it, for men, it's it was 13 years when this data was published. So actually, in the general population, women tend to outlive men. Mm -hmm. But in the learning disabled population, they've reversed that mortality. And that isn't something we have an answer for. And um, as usual, I imagine it's multiple component factors. Um, and, and there are studies that go into it um, so I won't try and answer it myself, but yeah, it's, um, it's probably changed now as the leader program is finding because they're doing a lot of the um, calculating the data, but this was pre-COVID and already there was a significant health inequality and I can't imagine given what I've just said that things have got better. So um, yeah, it's, it's probably not leveled up in any way because I haven't seen any initiatives that particularly tackle women's health. Thank you, Amy. That was a Thank fantastic you. journalist memorial lecture. Um, I think it's all given us lots to think about and, and certainly gave us a few explanations to check back to our practice, mm -hmm. but your stuff on ethics and why we mm -hmm. should be doing things differently is, is a message for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, where we're going is to drinks reception, I hope, <laughs> uh, which isn't that far away. It's the mere five-minute walk. Um, will we be guided? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's more than drink. There's apparently there's some food too, so you won't go hungry either. So um, thank you very much for uh, being here. Let's go and have a little bit of um, chat and food. Thank you very much. Yeah.